Uh, my name is Justin Benavides. I am uh, the district economist in District 1 in Amarillo. Uh, I'm coming to you live from my house. Uh, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Good morning. My name is Pancho Bello. I am the district economist in Vernon, Texas. And this is David Anderson. I'm, uh, I'm stationed in College Station and uh, livestock and food products economist. So, heck, we talk cattle prices or whatever you want, guys want to do. Hey, gang, um, uh, thanks for joining us today. You know, with all the turmoil in, in markets and cattle prices, you know, we really wanted to, to try to achieve a couple th things. One is we wanted, to, we wanted to work through you guys as we try to, uh, you know, keep people informed, keep our clientele informed, provide a forum to kind of talk about prices and markets, what's going on and what we expect. And also to take a look at a couple of decision aids we have, you know, with, with prices falling like they have uh, for folks who still have stockers, what do we try to do here? So we wanted to look at a couple of these, a couple of options. Uh, and, and so what we thought we would do is I'll talk cattle market for just a, a few minutes to kind of set the stage. And then I'll let Poncho uh, and Justin jump in and take a look at a couple of decision aids we put together and some, uh, you know, what we think about some various options of retaining ownership, holding cattle longer, uh, seeing some different ways to kind of work through where we're headed. So with that, uh, Justin, go ahead and advance the slides. Uh, uh, you know, we really are interested in some strategies that might help producers. And I think one of the rules we want to follow, we, we really want to follow is don't throw good money after bad. Um, you know, we, if we already have a bunch of stockers, if we've got uh, cattle on hand, uh, and in different segments of the industry, we want to try to take a look at what the way things are looking for, maybe reducing some losses or some ways to boost our profits. So uh, that's sort of our basic idea is to look at a few strategies and, and uh, see if we can't do a little better. Mm. You know, I think in a big picture, if we're going to talk cattle market for a second, uh, you know, if we think about it, about 50% of uh, food is consumed away from home. And if we extend that to, to beef, um, you know, we, I think that's a fair gauge. Now we might say a little bit less uh, than that 50% is consumed away from home in the beef market. But if you take a look at what's going on, why is the, why is the future market dropped like it has? Why has, you know, everything else dropped um, is this idea of, food away from home, are we slipping into a recession, unemployment, uh, income losses. We got grocery stores open and if you're like a bunch of us, if I don't know if you all have taken pictures of empty shelves, uh, it's, we've had plenty of those. Um, one of the things we're going to see, uh, well, I'll point that out on another slide. I wanted to, to point out too that one of the things that is, uh, I think has been overlooked some is that so far we've produced about five and a half percent more beef this year than last year. So we're producing a lot of beef. So, you know, we already had fed cattle prices declining because of this supply situation. So we got a lot of, a lot of beef on the market. Uh, one of the questions I got this morning by email is should we be worried about actually worried about shortages? Um, we're producing plenty of product. Uh, the only thing we have is, uh, is, is how do we get, you know, getting the stuff from where it's produced to the stores as fast as grocery stores need it and switching in the retail channel away from restaurants to, uh, to grocery store uh, purchases. Yet we still have restaurants doing takeout business. We have big swaths of the country that don't have the sort of shut down orders like we have in some big, uh, big cities and big consumer markets. So we've got a lot of shifting sands and getting product from one part from the grocery store chain or from the restaurant chain to the grocery store chain, yet still keeping supplies flowing to, to grocery stores. So one of the, I think is really important is notice that we've got these big supplies and we got a bunch of fears on the demand side. So next slide, Justin. I'm gonna start, I got four price charts. Um, first one I wanna show you is the box beef cutout for choice beef. That slide, anytime I make a slide and I see something that looks like that skyrocket 
point barreling up. I think I have made a mistake entering data. And I'll tell you, that's not a mistake. The yep. choice beef cutout surged $40 100 weight last week. Mm. Uh, we went from about 208 to 249. Oh, and, and so a weekly average won't quite be that high, but uh, I, I went ahead and stuck in where we were closing Friday to make the point that uh, as grocery stores have tried to restock their shelves, uh, it, it has required them to go out and, and make spot purchases in the wholesale market that they weren't expecting to be making. Uh, and so you see, you know, we see this choice, this uh, box beef cutout. If I showed you select, select did the same thing. Select was up uh, about $30, a hundred weight. So uh, really surging beef prices across the board and, and really in a, a pretty shocking manner. Uh, and so if we were looking at the next slide, which is fed cattle prices, I tried to slip that cue in there, Justin, <laughs> as I talk. Uh, we certainly see the, the fed cattle market sliding. For those of you who've looked at the futures market that has, you know, dropped 30, $40, a hundred weight, uh, you know, futures markets, uh, you know, markets, we often see markets talked about as some thing out there. The market does this. You know, a market is just people. A market is just people interacting, people buying and selling. And, and markets always overreact because us as people overreact. So on the futures market, we see a, a sharp decline in the futures. Yet in the cash fed cattle market, we have not seen as big a decline line as we've seen in the futures. We did drop to about 105 on some daily sales and particularly early last week. By the end of the week, we had, a, we had most cattle moving at somewhere between 111 and 113 across the broad swath of cattle feeding Hi. country. So uh, we, we certainly do have lower prices than a year ago. But this whole demand situation is also hitting right when we would be talking about our summer rally kicking in on top of five and a half percent more beef supply. So we've got some lower prices, yet in the cash market, it hasn't quite declined like the rest of it, like, like certainly like the futures. And we see the futures market responding by coming up over the last several days. So uh, anyway, I think that's worth pointing out as we take a look at the cash market. Uh, really fears over demand, yet the wholesale market has exploded. You may have seen reports that started out this weekend that uh, Tyson, uh, the meat packer, is going to essentially do some top-off payments this week in the fed cattle market to the tune of $5 a hundred weight. Basically, uh, I'm still looking for some more confirmation about some of that, but it's been fairly widely reported. So, <laughs> You know, I think, I think even this surge in the cutout market has taken them by surprise as well. And so we're going to see when, when prices are finally realized, we're going to see some higher prices this week if we include what we see in the marketplace plus a little extra. And I think it's worth pointing out that's a lot of turmoil that we're still going to have going on. Uh, next one, Justin. I got two more slides. One's the seven to 800 pound feeder steer market. Uh, the, the one after that's five to 600 pound steers. Uh, what I would really, you know, point out is one of the things we have not seen, at least until the end of last week, were calf market and feeder cattle markets declining like the fed cattle market has. I think in auctions towards the end of last week, we started seeing that really begin in earnest with some, you know, some markets reporting at the end of the week, uh, calf prices down, feeder cattle prices down anywhere from five to $15 a hundred weight in the, the stuff I had reviewed. So we're, we are starting to see some reflections in uh, those markets hitting as we, uh, as we, you know, as we're realizing lower fed cattle prices as well. So next slide, Justin. I think that's, <laughs> so, that's just our five to 600 pound Steers, I think I talked about that already, but again, we haven't seen the, the big decline like we've seen the others. It's really, it's really starting right now with the time lags we see in the marketplace. So we, we decided we'd look at several scenarios. One is, you know, for folks who still have stockers, you know what, for a lot of people, if they still have stockers out there, particularly on small grain pastures, uh, they were, you know, it's pretty likely they were intending to graze them out just uh, from a, 
a hollow stem on the wheat and things like that. So, and when that happens within the season, but we wanted to look at, you know, kind of taking, selling stockers now, uh, holding and grazing out, trying to sell in May, uh, and or, or retaining those into a feedlot and do those look like they might provide some more profits over selling now, trying to limit some losses. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to those guys, to Poncho. I think he's going next for a bit, and then Justin. And so with that kind of broad overview of prices and what's going <clears> on, uh, now I'll turn it over to those guys. Thank you, David. Justin, can you go to the next slide? Yes, sir. So what we what we did is we built some scenarios and trying to uh, to compare retaining strategies. What will be if we sell them now? Uh, what would be the profitability of selling them now, of keeping them until May, or retaining and going into a feed year? And we work on those. We work on uh, prices that we. This was. This was done last week, prices were a little lower than what they are today. Um, so we work on those and we build some scenarios and we did it based on basic assumptions. That, so everyone, if they have the Excel spreadsheet, any farmer, ran, every rancher can go there and work on their own numbers, put their, you know, what their, their cost is, um, what their variables is, how much did they, you know, when they purchase those those calves, how much did they pay, how much did they weigh, how much did they gain, and, and see you know what would be their best strategy given what they think prices, what they practice that they have. Next one. So the first you know scenario that we built was you know having stockers selling those stockers for you right now that they're about 700 pounds and you know we analyze we say well, well we if our grazing cost was uh, 50 cents, 55 cents per, per pound gain, uh, we purchased, you know, a calf that was 155. The purchase weight was 475. And those were things that they probably, some of them have done, you know, uh, a few months ago. <clears throat> um, so when, when we analyze those variables, if you haven't had anything you're probably going to have um, a loss, you know, returns about variable costs are gonna be, you know, are going to be negative. And this is without including any depreciation or- well, I don't management. know what Stephanie's doing with hers. Sorry? And Center's probably still got one. Whoever's talking- Probably that, one and a half, Center's got. I think we got him, go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, when we analyze that, we know that our break even price to cover all costs, if you have got in with those prices and weight, uh, it's about 135. And of course, now it's a little lower than that. Um, some of those ranches I've been working with, I've been talking with, they already had some of that cattle. So their, their price, average price, even with these lower prices, probably gonna be, you know, about that or even a little higher. Now on the, on the table below, what we can, uh, what we have is the plant returns and sensitivity analysis. And basically what here, what you can, you know, play with is, okay, what will be the calf price that we get into or we get in and what will be, you know, the price that I can sell it now and see, you know, what are gonna be our returns. Next one, Justin. Same thing we did for the stokers, 800 pounds. That means if you keep it now on wheat and you, you know, and, and you, you sell it in May, now they are the prices that what we have, or at least that last week we had for those, were about 10 cents lower than the previous <coughs> one. So in this case, with 10 cents lower price, we were losing more money retaining those tokers until May with the prices that we had last week. And of course, that's what the discussion is, okay, maybe this prices that we have last week were a lot, it was because people were panicking, the market was panicking, 
I mean, there was a lot of speculation in the market and there was not actually showing what the, the real market was. Um, and here again, you know, we have the sensitivity analysis saying, okay, if we get a 137 price, you know, and how much did you get into, you know, what, what would be, you know, the, your profitability. And again, you know, the break-even price to cover your cost, that is 128. And what I mean to cover your cost, sorry about <coughs> that one, we are not including, again, management fees or, you know, depreciation. So we'll be just, you know, the price to cover all your variable costs. That it, Poncho? Yeah, I'm, Justin, all yours. Okay. So the other option that we um, evaluated was the, the opportunity to maybe retain ownership through feeding. And so we evaluated two options. Basically, you can view this as those same stalkers that Poncho was just talking about. We just are running a scenario of, hey, I've decided that I'm going to, instead of selling that stalker right now, and just losing ownership, I'm gonna go ahead and sell into the feed yard and retain ownership. So I'm gonna sell from my pasturing enterprise, to my feeding enterprise, and then we'll also give the opportunity to keep on pasture until May and then make that same decision of retaining ownership, but putting them on feed in May rather than now in mid-March. And so we evaluated similar to what Poncho discussed earlier, um, both of those scenarios. So we made a couple of assumptions on the feeding side. We've got a cost of gain of, uh, of about 72 cents a pound that's going to include your your feeding cost your yardage cost um all those things that go into feeding um, including veterinary cost for these lighter calves that will be going in um in march we've got about a 210 day feeding feeding period um with an average daily gain we're assuming of about three and a half pounds um, again these let these numbers that we got here in blue are largely um, self-entry so uh, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of spreadsheets that you or your producers can use to evaluate this decision at the end but um, uh, these are kind of the key variables that we are evaluating around um, interest rate you can see here we're talking about these light calves that were going in in March at about 600 or seven, 690 700 pounds coming out a little over 1400 and that base price that we evaluated was about $125 uh, a hundred weight. Um, so we've got a sensitivity analysis based around cost of gain and a sensitivity analysis around the uh, sale weights, so evaluating different sale weights as well as different costs of gain under different price outcomes. And so uh, I haven't looked at the um, fat contract this morning, but um, for August, but I think this is gonna be a little low at this point. Um, we evaluated around this 100. You can see that this retained ownership uh, strategy, particularly on, on this side of um, cost of gain versus sale price, which is our really important sensitivity analysis that we'd be looking at, has a few more positive numbers here in the sensitivity analysis than the just stocking option does and just selling right now. But again, this is our March scenario. Now, if you were to run into, and let's say we're gonna go ahead and continue grazing through May and put, uh, put them in the yard and maintain ownership through, uh, again, about August, we're gonna have a shorter number of days on feed. You can see here we're only holding them for 180 days. So those March stalkers and the uh, May <clears throat> stalkers move to feed would be coming off about the same time because of that difference in the feeding period. Um, we've got, again, a few more positive numbers on the sensitivity analysis here than we had in our stocking uh, outcomes. And so, at least under these assumptions and these scenarios, um, the max positive outcome, if we look on this slide, if we're just looking at the base case scenarios for each of the sensitivity analysis, so we've got our retained ownership analysis and then our um, our stocking analysis, so sale out of the stocking enterprise and then um, the returns from retained ownership. Base case of uh, this price along with this cost of gain has a higher net return than our other outcomes. We've got some losses in the stocking operation and uh, some, some losses here on the base scenario on the retained feed guard analysis 
starting those light calves on feed, um, putting the heavier calves on feed later um, is leading to our highest outcome. Of course, that's subject to some assumptions. The key one being, if you don't have any pasture left or you've already sold them, this isn't really an option that's gonna work for you. But if you still have plenty of pasture, which I think some of this rain we've been having recently could be beneficial to that end, um, you think you've got enough forage left and you're not gonna have to supplement with much hay, this might be an option worth considering. And we've got some decision aids that can help you evaluate that decision, um, whether you wanna continue with this stocking enterprise or this try out this retained ownership option. Um, we've got a couple of different options for you to evaluate. So um, that's kind of our analysis. David, did you wanna go through some of these conclusions or Poncho or do we still have David? I'm here. I had muted it. Okay. I think I'm back. Okay. Well, um, the key I think is going to be, again, I always recommend that you evaluate these decisions for yourself. We've got decision aids at um, AgriLife Extension Economics, the website. There's a host of beef cattle decision aids, but you're going to want to use decision aid D4. It's a custom <clears throat> spreadsheet. Um, that's what we use to kind of run these numbers. And then at the uh, amarillo.tamu.edu website. We've also got a gain versus grain decision aid. So a lot of our producers in this area who are making that decision, a lot of them have probably already made the decision of whether or not to pull calves or leave them on. But we do have that decision aid available with current numbers. And then um, I guess, do you guys want to talk about any of these comparisons and conclusions? Any ideas that you have? Sure, I'll jump in here, Justin. Um, you know, what, what we try to do is, as we put these slides together is, you know, put some options together and, you know, help, might help you guys answer a question for somebody or answer, you know, answer your own questions. Um, you know, obviously we're in a pretty fluid time. It's, there's a lot of turmoil in markets uh, as just, as we sort out what's, <laughs> what's happening from day to day. Uh, certainly seeing futures markets come back. That's, I think that's pretty positive. Seeing cash prices hold up uh, as good as they have is pretty positive as well. And, and we, in those, each of those uh, little sensitivity analysis tables, there's a chance to look at a different set of prices. Uh, and so, you know, they, we put together just a few bullets to think about kind of some, some, uh, you know, in conclusion, some sort of what ifs, what could make it better or, or worse than what we've shown there. Uh, you know, I didn't say anything about, uh, you know, cow-calf stuff before, and that really wasn't the point of, of our talk, but I figured I would say something for sure is that, you know, I think one of the things that uh, our cow-calf producers, ranchers have working in their favor is really, is, is time. For folks who have, you know, calves born in the spring and sell in the, you know, summer or fall, uh, I think that time is going to work in our favor for a couple of reasons. One is we have fewer cows uh, today than we had a year ago, aren't we? In terms of the cyclical industry, our cow herds declining. So in the fall, we're going to have fewer calves for sale. Uh, we expect to see uh, very low crop prices. So feed costs are going to be low as well. I think that helps calf prices in the fall. Uh, and certainly some time for all of us and the whole economy to work through what's going on and hopefully it's shorter uh, rather than longer. And so, you know, I think there, I think I have a fair amount of optimism on the cattle market going forward, uh, particularly if, if for particularly for cow-calf producers who have, I think, that luxury of time. I think another thing that's going on is our, uh, if you look at the cull cow market, uh, we've had some higher cow prices than we did a year ago. One of the things that you'll notice at your grocery store, I'll tell you what, uh, hamburgers sold fast. <laughs> and, and that's one of the things that if we really are talking about recession, uh, people switch what they buy within beef. They buy more hamburger and fewer steaks. I think that supports our uh, cull cow market as well. So, you know, as, as producers think about those decisions, uh, you know, the, certainly it's no worse than it has been on the cull cow side in general uh, and some hopes for that to continue to improve seasonally. Uh, so I, I did want to throw out a couple of those comments for, you know, cow-calf and cull-cows as well. I did want to say, say one other thing is, 
for those of you who may have, you know, something with your, your livestock committees or, you know, for those of us who've had meetings canceled, you know, if there's an opportunity for us to do a Zoom thing, a cattle market thing, looking at different options, uh, we're all, we're all well, certainly willing and able to do any of these kinds of things that help you guys do your job. We just wanted to make sure that you guys knew, um, you know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll do a Zoom with a cattle market thing. Uh, anytime anybody, anytime y'all have a need for one, just, just let me know. And I know the same holds for Justin and Poncho. If you have some producers that want to talk about something like lamb, uh, you know, that's a, that's a more regional thing for many of us, the lamb and goat market. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the lamb market has a lot at risk in this. And so if you wanted to do something on by Zoom on lamb market, uh, sheep markets, uh, certainly cattle stuff, let, let any of us know because we'll, we'll do those for whatever set of producers you want to do. If you want to put it on your own website or whatever, we can, we can do something special with some, and, and tape it and put it on there and, and do some updates as we go along. So we sure wanted to make sure we had that option in front of y'all. One more thing I wanted to add, uh, Justin and David, is that re retaining strategies, you know, um, we reduce losses, you know, when we assumed that the market was better in a few months. If we look at the Chicago board, at the Chicago market, we were not able to see, you know, that retaining was better off. But we know that the market, or we believe that the market was not showing what was going on on the on the cash market but it was a little bit different so um, retaining strategies only make sense if we assume that the market is uh, not behaving as the chicago is behaving the cash market is a little is different and it's going to be different in a few in a few months so what i mean with that is that there is still risk you know, retaining. There is not, you know, say, if you retain, you're gonna be better. No, there is still some risk on retaining. Yeah, absolutely, that's a good point. It, it extends your opportunity for production risk and, and price risk, and I mean, mm -hmm. that's a good point, Poncho. I'm glad you, glad you pointed that out. After I said, it comes out better. <laughs> it, uh, it's a good point. I mean, even with that sensitivity analysis, there's a lot of, and that's why it's important to run your own numbers and use those decision aids if possible. Feel free to um, email us or uh, give us a holler. Uh, I guess, David, are you working from home? Poncho, you as well? Yes, I am. Yes. So um, I guess feel free to email us. Our, our emails were on the invitation that was sent out and we'd be happy to take any of your questions and um, if it needs to be conducted over a phone call, just shoot us an email and we'd be happy to give you a number to reach us at. That's no problem. And, you know, as this goes forward, if you, you know, if there's a, if, if y'all want us to do this again, just let us know. We can, you know, we got so many, you know, pretty big events happening in, in markets that things change so fast. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly willing to do stuff like this anytime, just get on and, and, you know, maybe show a couple slides and then just try to do some questions for, you know, whatever, whatever kind of stuff you all are hearing from people, if it would help. Uh, if you think this is useful to do again, we'll do it anytime you all want to do it. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you joining us.